When the armed forces of the New California Republic arrived in the Mojave in 2271, they faced issues tactically, strategically, and logistically. While companies of riflemen were an effective solution to most of those problems, logistics required a different response. The NCR needed trains in order to reliably and efficiently bring new troops and supplies from the Republic to their distant desert outposts. There were already multiple rail lines running to and through the Mojave, but the tracks hadn't seen maintenance in the near two centuries since the war. In order to restore the rail lines and build new ones where necessary, convicts from across the Republic were brought in to work on the railroad. I'm the Resolute Cartographer, and this is the story of those prison laborers and the group they formed. This is the story of the Powder Gangers. As the Republic planned to bring convicts into the southern Nevada desert, they needed a place to house them. As luck would have it, the pre-war state government had already established such a facility just outside the unincorporated community of Jean. This old prison was a near-perfect fit for the task, as a rail line ran past it just to the west. Though it was fairly run down by the time the NCR found it, with some repair work they brought it back online. Its trees were dead and the basketball court was cracked beyond repair, but it had walls, a water source, and power. The prisoners would be housed in the two cell blocks, while the guards would keep the visitor center and the administration buildings for themselves. The Republic staffed the prison with a garrison of troopers who manned the checkpoints within the prison and kept watch over the facility from the six watchtowers. Named the New California Republic Correctional Facility, or NCRCF, the prison was ready. Several dozen prisoners soon arrived and settled into their new home. These inmates came from a wide variety of backgrounds. There were cold-blooded killers like Scrambler, who was prone to relating his murder of innocent men, women, and children as casually as though he were speaking about the weather. There were career criminals like Joe Cobb, who was in prison for robbery, arson, and murder. There were gangsters like Dawes, who once ran a gang in the hub. There were thieves like Hannigan, a one-time NCR medic who was caught stealing medicine for resale. There were those that claimed to be innocent. Carter claimed to have been a casino worker in New Reno before his boss turned on him and had him falsely arrested. There were prisoners from the frontier like Samuel Cook. A native of the Mojave, Cook had been fighting to prevent the expansion of the NCR into his homeland when he was captured. There was even a prisoner who was a former law enforcement officer. Myers had been a sheriff in California when he committed one too many acts of unlawful justice and was sent to work on the railroad. Regardless of background, the fate that awaited these convicts was hard labor. Though the purpose of the program was nominally to reform the prisoners, most ended up with the impression that they were there to serve as a slave labor force, nothing more. They were soon trekking up and down the rail lines, using minecarts and hand cars to carry supplies to the work sites and debris away from them. At work, they straightened warped rail lines, replaced rotten ties, cleared landslide debris, and blasted rock to build new lines where necessary. It wasn't allowing the prisoners to do this blasting, coupled with the instability on the warfront, that would cost the Republic dearly. Six years after the NCR had arrived in the Mojave, they had fought Caesar's Legion in the Battle of Hoover Dam and won by a narrow margin. Since that close call, the Legion and the Republic had been fighting a war of attrition all along the Colorado River. It was costing the Republic personnel that were not quick or easy to replace. Shortly after the NCRCF began operations, the High Command began to pull troopers that were serving as guards off prison detail and send them to the front. As the prisoner-to-guard ratio rose, the warden could sense that he and his men were in danger. He wasn't experienced with Caesar's Legion, and thus he saw them as just another raider gang. Regardless of the threat, he didn't believe fighting the Legion justified putting himself and his people in danger. The warden was sure that there was a conspiracy brewing in his prison, and he suspected Samuel Cook, the former anti-NCR partisan and the head of the conspiracy. Cook and his followers were too polite, too obedient. He was sure there was something these model prisoners were hiding. In September 2281, he wrote a letter to his old friend Colonel James Shu, requesting that the colonel intercede with General Oliver on his behalf. Specifically, he wanted the general to stop pulling men away from guard duty and to send the promised replacements for those who had already left. The warden's concerns about Cook's conspiracy were validated the very night he composed that letter, when an explosion was heard from cell block A. The security wall separating the guards from the prisoners was blown open, killing the guards and letting the prisoners free. After a short battle, the remainder of the guards and the warden himself were dead. Samuel Cook, the NCR hitting guerrilla fighter, had managed to steal some of the dynamite used in building the railroad and used it to free his fellow convicts. With their victory won through the use of explosives, the former inmates became known as the Powder Gangers. Cook wasn't planning on sticking around to wait for the NCR to retake the prison, and thus he and his followers gathered what supplies they could and set off to the north-northwest. 
He and his people were soon hiding out in Vault 19, hoping to find a way to make war on the NCR. Another group of prisoners took off towards Prim, taking some of the explosives with them. These cons took control of the town, setting themselves up in the Bison Steve Hotel after killing the sheriff and his wife. Those powder gangers that remained at the NCRCF soon organized under Eddie. Little is known about Eddie, but he appears to have been feared or respected enough to gain the loyalty of most of the remaining powder gangers. He set himself up in the warden's old office, decorating it to his liking and surrounding himself 24-7 with a handful of bodyguards, including murderous Scrambler. Hannigan, the former NCR medic and the only member of the group with medical training, became the doctor for the prison. Carter, who had once operated as a contraband smuggler for his fellow inmates, became a trader and started operating the only shop in the prison. He secured his caps and goods, including a schematic for powder charges in one of the old cells. Dawes, the former gang leader, took over the prison entrance, serving as a gatekeeper, taking a bribe from those that entered. Myers, the former sheriff, tried to maintain a low profile in the new order. Outside the prison, Eddie's loyalists set up four camps watching for passing caravans. When they confronted the caravans, the powder gangers demanded a toll be paid for passing through their territory. If the caravanners resisted payment, the powder gangers would kill them and take their cargo. Sometimes though, the toll wasn't even demanded. When a Crimson Caravan Company caravan run by Ringo was passing by their camps, it was attacked out of the blue. Ringo made a run for it. He managed to outrun the powder gangers, and he got all the way to the nearby town of Good Springs where he took shelter. Career criminal Joe Cobb chased him there and proceeded to threaten the residents of the sleepy little ranching community to hand Ringo over or face the consequences. I told the rest of that story in my Good Springs lore video if you're interested. As for the remainder of the outlying camps, while most of them paid Eddie his due tribute, one refused. Chavez, the head of this camp, had decided to keep his loot a decision he would come to regret when the courier arrived at the NCRCF in October 2281. The exact nature of the courier's interactions with the NCRCF was highly dependent on their previous interactions with the Powder Gangers, more specifically, the Powder Gangers in Good Springs with Joe Cobb. If the courier helped Good Springs and killed Joe Cobb and his men, the courier got a pretty poor reception at the NCRCF. Even if they dressed up as a Powder Ganger, on closer inspection, they got a poor reception. If the courier just ignored the situation, they're greeted with mild hostility at the front gate and are charged 100 caps by Dawes to enter. If, however, the courier helped Joe Cobb, they're allowed to enter without a toll charge. This is the sum total of appreciation given to the courier for the murder of a town of friendly, innocent people. Anyway, assuming that the courier was allowed to enter the prison, they went to the administration building where they met Eddie. Eddie explained his problem with Chavez going his own way and asked the courier to sort it out. The courier traveled to the South Powder Ganger camp where they found Chavez and his gang. If the courier was a fairly skilled speaker, they could have talked Chavez into making a run for it. If not, or if the courier was simply feeling particularly violent, they could simply blow Chavez and his minions away. Upon returning to Eddie, the courier was tasked with dealing with a strange merchant that had appeared on the border of Powder Ganger territory. This merchant had wandered into hostile territory alone and was just hanging out. Something about it was off, so Eddie wanted it checked out. The courier departed for Gene's skydiving where they found the supposed merchant leaning against the old office. When confronted, the merchant quickly revealed himself to be a bounty hunter hunting the powder gangers. As with Chavez, with the tiniest nudge, the bounty hunter was convinced to leave or was killed by the courier. Eddie had one final task for the courier when they returned. He recognized the tenuous position of the powder gangers and believed that the NCR might be attempting an assault at any time. Thus, he sent the courier to nearby Prim to determine if this attack was imminent. Once in Prim, the courier spoke with two potential sources of information. NCR Lieutenant Hayes and Johnson Nash, the operator of the local Mojave Express station. Lieutenant Hayes was willing to discuss the general problems caused by the NCRCF breakout, but refused to speak on the upcoming assault. Johnson Nash wasn't bound by the same rules as Lieutenant Hayes, though he was expecting a 100 cap of bribe for information. The courier paid Nash the bribe, or if skilled enough in speech, the courier was able to intimidate Nash into spilling his guts for free. Nash revealed that the NCR was indeed planning to assault the prison at any time. With this information in hand, the courier was faced with a dilemma. Return to Eddie and warn him of the assault, 
or join the NCR in the destruction of the Powder Gangers. We've reached the real point of no return in the story, and as neither ending is known to be canonical, I'll detail each individually. We'll start with a story such that the Courier chose to help the Powder Gangers. Determined to aid their new companions at the NCRCF, the Courier struck out for Lieutenant Hayes' tent in Prim, hoping to convince him to stop the attack. The Lieutenant wasn't happy when the Courier suggested he call the attack off, and told them that they weren't welcome there anymore. The Courier then returned to the NCRCF and warned Eddie of the impending attack. As the alarms began to blare, like it was clear that this attack was no already occurring. Eddie told the courier there was no reason for them to stay and fight, but suggested that they might kill a few NCR soldiers on their way out. Exiting the administration building, the courier felt the blast waves from three separate explosions as the NCR blew holes in the fence. NCR troopers swarmed in and were rapidly overpowering the powder gangers. The courier fought back against the troopers and saved the powder gangers of the NCRCF from complete destruction. Eddie appeared to be grateful even if he didn't out and out say it. He welcomed the courier to stick around as long as they liked. In this version of the story, the courier gets a boost to powder ganger rep and a severe cut to NCR rep. Alright, let's explore the opposite end of this. Determined to bring an end to the armed robbery and murders caused by the powder gangers, the courier went to Lieutenant Hayes' tent in Prim. The courier told Hayes that they wanted to help out in the assault on the prison, and Hayes agreed to let them take part. He sent the courier on to speak with Sergeant Lee just south of the prison. Upon reaching the sergeant, he told the courier that their goal was to kill Eddie, as they hoped that in decapitating the powder gangers that the rest would scatter. With that said, the NCR soldiers and the courier charged the prison. Three blasts blew holes in the fence and the soldiers moved in. While the skilled powder ganger snipers took down an attacking soldier or two, the assault quickly overwhelmed the yard and the soldiers moved into the administration building. The fight inside was a rapid and deadly affair, with the entirety of the powder ganger population of that building falling in no more than a few minutes. When Eddie fell, the courier took a key from him that allowed them to enter his personal stash room full of ammunition and other loot. Sergeant Lee explained that everything was in hand now and they would mop up the stragglers. He told the courier to check in with Lieutenant Hayes when they got the chance. When investigating, Investigating the prison, the courier discovered that not all the powder gangers had fallen in the fight. Those that remained in the cell blocks were hostile, as were those in the visitor center, aside from Myers, who seemed happy that the NCR had finally retaken the prison. Back in Prim, Lieutenant Hayes simply stated that he had expected the undisciplined powder gangers to die as they had. The courier gets a boost to NCR rep and a severe cut to powder ganger rep. Okay, that covers both potential outcomes for the second fight for the NCRCF, but those aren't the only powder gangers. There are other locations where these people can be found. If you're interested in the outcome for the Vault 19 powder gangers, you can check out my lore video on the topic, but the basic gist of it is that they end up members of the Great Cons, they surrender to the NCR, or they all die if the vault's blown up. As for the Good Springs Powder Gangers, I covered their story in my video on Good Springs. Long story short, either they're dead or they're in control of Good Springs. As for the Powder Gangers that moved on to Prim, they're a different story entirely. None of the other Powder Ganger factions are on good terms with these Powder Gangers. Their boss, a man simply named Escaped Convict Leader, is the target of the Courier when they're trying to free Prim from the clutches of these violent raiders. This story also has something to do with Myers, but I'll cover that when I cover Prim. There are just a few more groups to cover. Just east of Vault 19, the Powder Gangers control Whitaker Farmstead and Hunter's Farm. These Powder Gangers, though closer to Samuel Cook in proximity than to the NCRCF faction, seem to be a part of the NCRCF faction. I think it's likely the case that these are simply more distant versions of the Powder Ganger camps near the prison. Neither of these groups seem long for this world. The Powder Gangers at Hunter's Farm are slain by geckos by the time the courier reaches them, and those at Whitaker Farm are close to a lot of dangerous fauna. With that, we just have two groups left. First, we have the Powder Gangers that made it to Nipton. These unfortunate souls were crucified by the Legion. The only survivor of this event was Oliver Swanick, who can be found fleeing the town when the courier arrives. Lastly, when the courier is walking south out of Prim, they can find two former inmates of the NCRCF walking down the highway. These two are typically killed by a local band of the Jackals gang. That pretty much covers the potential outcomes, so what does this mean all told? In all likelihood, the powder gangers would be a short-lived phenomenon in the history of the Mojave Wasteland. If everything goes their way, they control the NCRCF and Good Springs. The NCR would be certain to attack with a larger force and wipe the Powder Gangers out. Alright, I think that covers the story of the Powder Gangers, but I've got some notes on this content before closing things out. 
First, I want to note that this isn't the first time that I've talked about the Powder Gangers and it won't be the last. This is now the third video I've produced on Fallout New Vegas, with the other two covering Good Springs and Vault 19, both locations that had Powder Ganger stories connected to them. Some of y'all who have now watched all three of these New Vegas lore videos might be getting tired of hearing about the Powder Gangers and I get it, but I feel that it's necessary to cover locations and organizations thoroughly. Take heart to those of you who are sick of them, there are only three more videos that will necessarily mention them. The Prim video, the Nipton video, and one that is undoubtedly years away that will cover the endings to Fallout New Vegas. Second, I already talked about the real world inspiration for the NCRCF, so I'll just quote myself from my Good Springs video. A note about the NCRCF's inspiration, the Gene Conservation Camp. According to the government site outlying the prison's purpose, the Gene Conservation Camp is a minimum security women's prison where the inmates clean up highways, complete conservation projects, and fight wildfires. Basically, they perform labor for the state, which is exactly what the NCR did with the inmates of the NCRCF. Third, the prison that became the NCRCF is an interesting site to consider. When I started writing about it, I originally wrote, Though it was fairly run down by the time the NCR found it, it had walls, a source of water, and power. And then I thought, why would it not have already been occupied then? Dawes, the gate guard, even refers to it as the biggest, baddest fort in the wasteland. This gives us two options for the history of the prison between the war and the arrival of the NCR. Option A, the prison had walls, water, and power, and was occupied by a group of wastelanders that were then kicked out by the NCR. Or, option B, the prison walls were intact, but the water and power were not available, and the prison was unoccupied. I think that option B is the more likely scenario. The main thing biasing me towards that answer is that we don't have anything in the world that hints at the first option. No angry evictees, no obvious sign they were ever there. It's possible that there were walls, water, and power, and that the prison was controlled by raiders, that the NCR killed these raiders, and that the subsequent occupation erased any remaining trace of these raiders, but this is a complete construction based on supposition, with no backing in the lore. In fact, the NCR assault on the prison involves blowing holes in the wall. The absence of any obvious repairs made to the wall blows holes in this theory. To sum this point up, because it seems like the prison was unoccupied when the NCR arrived, I wrote into the narrative that water and power weren't initially available in the prison. Fourth, there are outhouses at the NCRCF. There are also toilets in these rooms. I think that the reason there are both is apparent in the disgusting green pools that surround the outhouses and that can be found behind a couple of the buildings. It looks to me like the prison was built with a septic system, and these green pools behind the cell blocks and the visitor center are signs that it's overflowing and would need to be pumped. Because the NCR likely doesn't have septic trucks to pump the tanks, I think they chose to dig outhouses, and that the cesspools for those outhouses are now full. Basically, I'm saying that this place probably stinks to high heaven. Fifth, there was once a second ring of fencing around the prison. This ring is in far worse shape than the inner ring, but be careful going through any holes, as the powder gangers have laid traps near some of the breaches. Sixth, it's entirely possible to enter the NCRCF for free without working with Joe Cobb. When you arrive at the NCRCF, rather than talking to Dawes, you can follow the fence line. You can then take advantage of an exploit in the game by engaging with one of the outhouses through the fence. This will activate a sitting animation that will pull you inside the fence. Once inside, you can't go through the front door as Dawes still has it locked and he holds the key, but you can go ahead and speak with Eddie anyway and start the quest line. While this might seem like you're locked in the prison, have no fear, you can simply climb one of the watchtowers and jump over the fence without harming yourself. Consequently, I can't help but wonder how the NCR expected this to keep people in, but regardless. You can simply use the outhouse watchtower method of entering and leaving the prison and never pay Dawes his 100 cap toll. Seventh, I don't like that the quest that leads to the battle for the NCRCF is at the end of Eddie's given quest line. I've played Fallout New Vegas several times over the years, and I didn't know this quest was there until I started filming footage for this video. This is due to the fact that I always side with the people of Good Springs against Joe Cobb, and thus I am always fired upon when approaching the NCRCF. Until I made it a point to explore all possible options, I didn't know you could actually join the NCR in retaking the prison. I've cleared the prison myself many times, but never in this proper assault. Eighth, when Eddie tells the courier, quote, there's no reason for you to stick around and help us, but feel free to kill a few of the bastards on the way out, unquote, it feels like a reference to The Simpsons. Specifically, I'm talking about season eight, episode two, You Only Move Twice, in which Homer's supervillain boss, Hank Scorpio, tells Homer, quote, 
Homer, on your way out, if you want to kill somebody, it would help me out a lot, unquote. That may be simply my Simpsons drenched brain spitting out connections that aren't there, but that's what I thought of. Ninth, when it comes to the best choice for gameplay, there's no question on which side to choose, the NCR. The Powder Gangers control a handful of locations across the southwestern wasteland. The NCR has outposts everywhere. Unless you're planning on siding with the Legion, siding with the Powder Gangers is only going to make your life harder. Beyond this, the initial fight to save the Powder Gangers is much more daunting, as the troopers are better armed and armored than the Powder Gangers. In my footage of the attack with the NCR, I was level 5 and just fine with the gear I had. When I filmed defending against the NCR, I had God Mode activated. Lastly, the loss of the NCRCF was completely unnecessary and shows serious problems with the Republic's operations. Let's consider the mistakes here. First of all, it's crazy that they would have kept Samuel Cook and the NCRCF. He was an experienced guerrilla fighter and explosives expert who was given access to dynamite. Maybe with adequate supervision, this could have worked, but it still feels like a recipe for disaster. Second, and this goes with the above, what the hell were they thinking giving prisoners access to dynamite? The prisoners should never have been near anything like that. If they had to do some blasting, they should have called in the quarry workers from nearby Sloan and had them do the blasting, then brought the prisoners back out to do cleanup. Third, what were they thinking taking more and more guards away from the prison? Even if the prisoners hadn't gotten their hands on dynamite, NCR Command reduced the number of guards to unsafe levels. This means that when the prison fell, they had to bring in more troops to clean the situation up. It feels like the people in charge of the NCR military are not the best equipped to do the job. Alright, I think that'll do it for the story of the Powder Gangers. If you want to receive notifications when I launch lore videos, you can follow me on Twitter at GamingWithMaps. I've started streaming on YouTube again. I'm going to do this at least once a week going forward. I don't have a specific time nailed down, but I'll announce when I'm going to stream a day ahead on Twitter. If you're interested, come check it out. If you appreciate what I do here and you want to support the channel financially, you can become a patron with Patreon. I want to thank my patrons Mesothelioma, 76 of Texas, Jill AWS, Dark Malcontent, Brian, Real76, Dr. Orion, Samsung Smart Fridge, and Knight Spearhead for their support. This has been the Irresolute Cartographer. Thanks for watching. I'll see you again next time.